Okay, I, you will be live in just a moment. Okay. We are live. Terrific, thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hina Shaw and I'm a senior analyst at the Kansas Health Institute. I will be facilitating the telehealth work group through the end of this year. And so thank you all for joining us today. And I hope to have a really robust conversation today. So my colleague, Carrie Bruffett is also on and I have a few other KHI members that I'll um, introduce over time. She is going to share the um, agenda with us so I can kind of go through that. First, I wanted to make sure that we have everyone here. I think we should give maybe two or three more minutes for everyone to join. I see about half of the group present at this point. Hina, is this an appropriate view? I can try to download the PDF onto my desktop. I'm just showing it in Teams. Does that show up okay? It does. Maybe making it a little smaller or bigger so they can see the entire agenda. Will do. Think. There you go. All right, so now that we have kind of most of our members present, I'd like to invite Eileen Ma from the revisor's office to please read us the COMA and CORE statement. Thank you, Hina. Um, this is Eileen, I'm from the revisor's office and I wanted to share some information with you regarding the Kansas Open Meetings Act and the Kansas Open Records Act. So here we go. Um, meetings of the telehealth working group of the 2021 Special Committee on, the, on Kansas Mental Health Modernization and Reform are being conducted virtually, allowing members of the public without cost to listen to the meeting using live stream broadcasting on the internet. Live Audio and video of each meeting will be available on the Kansas Legislature website and the Kansas, Kansas Legislature YouTube channel. Documents being presented to the working group will be available on the Kansas Health Institute website, and a link to these documents is also available in the description section of the YouTube feed. As a subgroup of a legislative committee, the Kansas Open Meetings Act and the Kansas Open Records Act apply to this group. Members of the working group should be mindful of some key requirements of those laws. First, the Kansas Open Meetings Act requires that meetings of legislative bodies be accessible to the public, and a meeting is any gathering by a majority of the group's members for the purpose of discussing the business or affairs of the group. A meeting can occur virtually or through a series of communications, such as members communicating in small groups who then communicate with other members, eventually reaching a majority of the working group. A meeting can also occur even if no formal vote or action is taken by the members. The working group should take a few steps to ensure that the public has adequate access to each meeting. Any person who is speaking must be clearly identified. Every person who is not speaking should mute their microphone so as not to impede the ability of listeners to hear the proceedings. And third, each motion must be clearly stated before the working group votes and the chairman must announce the results of each vote. The Kansas Open Records Act requires that public records be open for inspection by any person. These records include recorded information regardless of form that is made, maintained, kept by or in the possession of the working group. Documents that are presented to the working group must be accessible to the public. And if a member shares a document that contains sensitive or private information with the working group, be mindful that that document will become a public record. Finally, any member of the subcommittee who has a question or concern about these requirements should contact me or any other, any revisors who staff the special committee. And with that, Hannah, you're all set. Thank you, Eileen. So today we are all meeting because we are going to revisit the 2020 recommendations um, that were established by a telehealth subgroup. And so last year there were three working groups and members of those three working groups formed a subgroup to come up with and develop 
the five recommendations that were proposed by this telehealth subgroup. And so today we're going to revisit those five um, recommendations and propose any updates or revisions to ensure that we're looking at actionability for um, this upcoming session. And so with that, I'm going to um, ask Carrie to stop sharing the screen. And I'm going to ask each of the telehealth work group members to introduce themselves. And as you are introducing yourself, please give your name, your title, the organization you're with, and which of the 2020 telehealth recommendations you would really like to focus on and unpack today. So I'm going to, for ease, call on names. And as I call on you, please introduce yourself. So I'll start off with our two co-chairs. Um, the first one, Sunny Mickle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sunny Mickle, and I'm with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas. Um, I'm excited to be here today. I participated last year with some of the working groups that we had and also with some of the meetings. And I thought they did a great job um, working out and discussing some of the common issues that are present today with mental health care and how telehealth services can complement and provide greater access to care. Some of the things that I did want to talk about today, if we have time, would be really discussing more about the reimbursement challenges the providers are having with telehealth services, how those compared um, prior to the passage of the Kansas Telemedicine Act, um, and then also how they compare now even with um, some of the different reimbursement models that are out there due to COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite our other co-chair, Shauna Wright. Good afternoon. It's so good to see you all. My name is Shauna Wright. I am a licensed psychologist uh, by profession. I am the associate director of KU Center for Telemedicine and Telehealth. I, I also am the president and CEO of an independent telepsychology practice that has been upstanding uh, for about 11 years. So. Very much prior to the pandemic, I have a lot of experience in, in telehealth. And I'm also, the other hat I wear is I work with the Rural and Frontier Subcommittee of the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council uh, that has a great interest in telehealth. And so those are the hats that I wear. I'm very glad to see you all. Uh, much like Sunny, I'm very interested in talking about payment parity um, and maybe more conservative, conservatively than some might expect. And of course, uh, one of my passions that I'd love to see us get to today as well is quality assurance with telehealth. Thank you. Uh, Representative Landwehr, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, Representative Landwehr, I do chair the uh, Mental Health Modernization Committee and have been fortunate to get to do this for the second year and looking forward to what we can come up with on a uh, solution in this area of telehealth. And I think you're probably going to discuss this later, but he and I kind of jump ahead of things is, uh, and I think Sonny kind of brought this up and uh, many people are aware of it. The block that we ran up against was uh, discussion on what the rates are, what the rates should be, and what they shouldn't be, and that's what kept us from advancing. And I think at the same time, we want to look and see what is it, you know, is there language changes that we want to, to make to the uh, telehealth? Because we feel like the work that was done a few years back was a pretty good job. So um, I'm a legislator from the 105th District out of Wichita and look forward to the work from this group. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Sandra Berg. Good afternoon. I'm Sandra Berg with United Healthcare. I'm the Behavioral Health Director for our Medicaid and um, continuing the work that this group did last year. I'd like to see us look at how we can use telehealth with the child welfare system. I think we have lots of opportunity to be innovative using telehealth with that um, particular population, in addition to what the others have said around rates and quality assurance. Thank you. Next, I have Brittany Nichols. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brittany Nichols. I coordinate the EMS for Children program in Kansas with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. 
And I would say the recommend recommendation I'm most excited or most interested to unpack further is just seeing how telehealth can improve the child welfare system in Kansas and seeing what benefits it can provide to the children currently in that system. So thank you, excited to be here. Thank you. Next up, Christina Morris. Hi, um, my name is Christina Morris. I am the regional director of state government affairs with CVS Health um, and Aetna Better Health of Kansas. I'm new to the mental health modernization committee um, working groups and looking forward to participating on this committee. Um, and I don't have a particular one I'm interested in. I'm trying to get up to speed on all the issues. So looking forward to, to diving into each of them with with all of you. So. Thank you. Next up, Jennifer Finley. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Finley with the Kansas Hospital Association. Uh, I was not part of this group last year, so I am new in learning about the issues you all have specifically talked about, but have been around the issue of telemedicine and telehealth and working with our hospitals for years. So excited to be here and to see what we can contribute to this conversation. Thank you. As I'm going through this, have I missed any other members? I know there's two phone numbers, so if you'd like to identify yourselves, um, I'll start with starts with 913 and ends in 50. This is Connie Freeze. Hi, Connie. Would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, this is Connie Freeze with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City. Terrific. And so during the introductions, Connie, we are asking that everyone says their name, title, organization, and which of the 2020 telehealth recommendations you'd like to focus on and unpack today. Oh, I, I apologize. I am traveling, so I don't have them in front of me. I'm driving. Completely fine. Do you mind just stating your title and organization then? Yeah, yes, Vice President, Government Relations. Thank you, so Kansas City. Thank you, Connie. All right, the other phone number I see starts with 785 and ends with 65. Yeah, hi, this is Stuart Little with the Behavioral Health Association of Kansas. It's an association of substance use disorder treatment providers, and I apologize this fit into time I was traveling, so I'll just be on the phone. We're obviously interested in uh, telemedicine, behavioral health services, uh, and um, the, the, the payment issue is an issue, and kind of note that on the Medicaid and public side, there is payment parity through the telemed, and I'll be curious to see how uh, that might translate into the commercial side. Thank you, and I'm just going to announce the other members' names, and if you're present, please let me know. Representative Tori Arnberger. Senator McGinn, Carolyn McGinn. Andrew Brown from KDEX. Rennie Schuler from Advent Health. Candice Sinai from Cigna. And Claudia Tucker from Telehealth, Teledoc Health. All right, I don't hear them then. So for others that are on the this call, I have a few folks from the Kansas Health Institute. Do you mind waving now? Thank you. And we have some staff from KLRD. Would you mind waving now? All right. Thank you. Anyone else that hasn't announced themselves that is in the meeting room? Tina, I'm going to interrupt you just a moment. Apparently, Claudia may be muted by our host. I don't see her on here. I think she's a phone number. Because I know you called Claudia just I a minute only, ago. I only see two phone numbers on here. I apologize. Samaya, so Carrie, do you see any other phone numbers? I don't at the moment, no. Perhaps she can leave and rejoin. We'll send her an email to leave and rejoin. Um, thank you, Representative Landwehr. I will say there is one more person in the room. Um, she's with Teladoc. Do you see? I'm sorry, Hina. Do you see Teladoc on there? 
I don't. Okay. All right. Fine. I'll text her. Okay. Hi, and this is Patty Sosa. I'm also with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas City. Uh, I work directly with Connie, and I am the manager of our digital healthcare strategy, um, really specifically working on all things telehealth, um, both um, and especially behavioral health. So I'm uh, appreciate the the invite today. Thank you. Thank you. And then we also have Francie Moore Hunter on here to substitute for Sarah Ferdig from KDHE because she had a conflict at this point. All right, um, Carrie, would you mind sharing that agenda one more time? And maybe in that time, um, Claudia will have a chance to join. But I did want to go through, since this is our first meeting, to talk about our meeting commitments. Um, these are the commitments that were used last year um, with the subgroup. And if you could scroll up just a little bit, Carrie. But it's come ready to discuss and compromise. Keep remarks succinct and on topic. Don't hesitate to ask clarifying questions and I'll make sure that we start and end on time. And so are there any other meeting commitments that anyone would like to add to this list that we really keep in mind as we start this process? All right, hearing none, we will jump right in then. So Carrie, would you mind sharing the Excel spreadsheet? This tool was sent out to all of you earlier this week. It was sent out by KLRD. Did everyone receive it? Is there someone that did not receive it? All right, it sounds like everyone received it. So we are going to go through it um, recommendation by recommendation and be able to discuss kind of what happened and if any revisions are necessary. So let's go ahead and dive right in. And before I do that, Representative Landwehr, have you been able to get in touch? Uh, we're working on that. Okay. All right. Then I'm going Hina, to start. Hina, we have a question in the uh, in the chat about the work, uh, the list of working group members being shared at the meeting. And yes, we will send out the the full list of the working group members. There's a. Uh, a, a PDF that talks about has each topic and issue and working group members for all three work groups and we'll send that around. It's also available in the meeting materials um, that will be posted or that have been posted. Thank you, Carrie. All right, so let's start with the first recommendation 10.1, which is quality assurance. So this recommendation um, develops standards to ensure high quality telehealth services are provided, including establishing consistent guidelines and measures for telehealth in collaboration with licensing and regulatory agencies, implementing standard provider education and training, ensuring patient privacy, educating patients on privacy related issues, allowing telehealth supervision hours to be consistently counted toward licensure requirements and allowing services to be provided um, flexibly when broadband access is limited. So that was the recommendation from last year and the action lead, there were various action leads identified. And so the key collaborators were KDHE, paid ads, providers, BSRB, private insurers and regulatory agencies. And so there was an update that was shared with all of you by BSRB and also by KDEG. So the first question that I want to pose to the group is really looking at the enablers. So what are some factors that enable this recommendation to make the progress that it did last year? Who would like to start this conversation? Hannah, this is um, Sandra Berg with United. I think one of the largest enablers was the collaboration across agencies to move this through, um, working with the BSRB, the legislative session, um, KDHE, KDADS, everyone working together to move it along. Thank you, anyone else? All right. Um, what are some barriers then, perhaps, you know, what are some barriers that didn't allow this recommendation to become fully actionable? I 
You know, this is Brenda Landwehr, and we did have the a bill drafted for this, and we started the hearings on this, and it was derailed when some of the conferees uh, approached the committee and wanted to amend the legislation to add rate parity. The difficulty we have with that is what is rate parity and what it means to one person, it means something else to someone else. So that's something that definitely has to have some uh, clarity. There were a lot of things that occurred because of the pandemic uh, by some of our insurance companies that wasn't the norm. And now I think we've got some individuals that think maybe that should be the norm. So this is what we have to uh, get addressed. And I think we have the members on the committee that can help us do that. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share? This is Shauna Wright with the Center for Telemedicine. I, I think that part of it is that this is a pretty broad goal or, or objective. And with the time that we've had in operating, you know, during a pandemic, I'm really impressed with the work that we've done. But to, to tick all of the boxes in the time uh, that we've had, I think time is a barrier because there are those who have worked in the telehealth world for quite some time and those who are brand new to it. So getting on the same page and making leaps and bounds in that time um, would be difficult. Uh, but I do think the progress that was made is substantial. Um, and I, I am impressed with where we where we got last year. Hi, this is Sunny Mickle, um, Vice President of Government Community Relations, Blue Cross of Kansas. And I just wanted to add too that I agree um, with the comments that have been made. And I think there is also um, last year it was a little confusion, perhaps, for some practitioners and providers that were currently offering telehealth services and those that were not as to what was already covered under the law and then what needs to happen to correct anything or improve upon uh, the changes that have already been made by the Kansas Telemedicine Act. So I think with having more time, there'll be an opportunity to clarify what actually is covered under the law today and what barriers are in place that may need to have um, improved, uh, be improved overall moving forward in the future. Yeah, would anyone else like to share a barrier? You know, what I might add to this process is I, uh, I know that when we met last week laying out the agenda, there was discussion that perhaps we were uh, maybe missing a couple of folks on, on this committee. And I thought that they would be on there here today, but it hasn't happened. And that would be uh, the hospital association. So we should have that by next time because they were one of the proponents of a rate parity. And then the other would be the uh, uh, physician from the Kansas Medical Society. So hopefully we'll have uh, those two providers involved in this mix so that we can have a full discussion. So Representative Landwehr, Jennifer Finley is on from the Kansas Hospital Association, if that's helpful. Okay, I didn't recognize the name, so thank you. Jennifer, did you have something to add to this conversation? Uh, no, I was just going to clarify that I am in fact here representing hospitals. Terrific. Jennifer, I, I apologize. I'm trying to juggle two computers and get Claudia up. So I did not catch that, but welcome to the committee. No worries. So then if we go back to the language and the recommendation itself, so that's in column F, um, are there any revisions that need to be made to the language that's there? This is Sandra Brooke with United. I was just looking at the ensuring patient privacy and educating patients on privacy related issues and wondering if we need to be more specific around that. And I see Shauna shaking her head. <laughs> She's more of an expert than I am. We've had lots of discussions lately here around privacy issues and confidentiality. So. Um, I'm going to kick it over to you, Shauna, <laughs> to see what you have to say around that. Thank you. This is Shauna Wright with the telemedicine, the Center for Telemedicine. 
that's a broad one. And when we make it that succinct, because we look at patient privacy in terms of the technologies that we use, but if we're delivering services in the home, there's also that education of patient privacy where they're receiving services, whether that they're connecting from their office, from their home, um, or any other location. It's still on us as providers to help ensure that privacy and to provide that education. And Sandra, I'd even go a step further and say, I don't think it's even just about providing them uh, education about how to maintain and ensure their own privacy, but I'm even thinking about like e-health literacy. How do we help educate our patients about how telehealth works and why if you're seeing a provider who's licensed in Kansas, you need to be in Kansas at the time of that appointment. Uh, so I see it, you know, I would like to see just an expanded uh, patient education about telehealth, which includes privacy, but, but we have to look both at the technology and, and how we look at privacy and confidentiality, as well as the experience and, and what that environment is like for the patient. And Shauna, I'm going to ask you a question because I'm wondering also, do some providers record their virtual visits? Is that something that also should be discussed and decided upon as, as a standard of care? Right, absolutely. In general, the answer to that is no. However, we have moved to an age right now where many of our providers in training are recording sessions. Again, there's a patient consent that needs to come with that. But in addition to just being recorded, they need to know where that information is housed and how secure it is. So for the general licensed provider, the answer to that is no. But for those who may be in training or may be under supervision, that could happen. Um, so I do think that we need to discuss that. The, the other thing I'd add to that, Sunny, is not only about you know, providers recording it, but how do we talk with our, our patients, particularly teens, about the, the risks associated with if you try to record your appointment, you know, what's the risk of you recording an appointment or, or, or a session and, and then maybe sharing it on social media or sharing a clip of it here or there. Um, recording brings a whole nother level of risk to, to what we do, I think, in terms of privacy and confidentiality. Thank you. That question has come up quite a bit lately with um, people that have asked me about telehealth services. So I think it's important that we talk about that. I do. I don't know that every practitioner might understand or provider might understand that if you do record um, really by, by our best guidance, that that recording should become a part of the patient's record. Um, not just something that we house on the cloud or try to keep secure, but it's actually it should be a part of the record. Um, and I don't know that all providers understand that. Uh, this Can is Sandra with United again. And I Sorry, Sunny. Um, and I think that's an element we may not have addressed here, Shauna, is the whole documentation piece around telehealth services and how if there is a recording or how how documentation of that that session needs to match what they're doing within the session. Anyway, right. just a thought. <laughs> Yeah, this is Shauna again, and there are best practices in terms of documentation, but oftentimes they're not legislated, right? But how do we help our providers get education about best practices for documenting, documenting a telehealth appointment? Not only to document, you know, what's happened in that appointment, but, you know, if an insurer or, you know, um, there's any kind of audit, you know, how do we write a note that helps, you know, really describe what happened in that session? Even technologically, you know, when I do a note, I'll write in, you know, this session was successful. There was the technology was successful, but if I've had interruptions, I document that as well. So that if there's an audit for time in, in that session that I've documented what that disconnect was, how it was reconnected, what the follow up is. And those are standards that I don't think the average provider is going to be aware of unless they've done some training. So, am I hearing that we want to modify the recommendation, perhaps add one more bullet point discussing documentation for providing best practices or education to providers? Um, how I was you thinking like about education for providers. 
And then also uh, touching on patient privacy and for helping with education with providers, I think cybersecurity is very important because they're networking um, perhaps from their uh, their work laptops and may not be working at a larger healthcare system and may not have some of the same um, cybersecurity protocols in place that a larger system would have. But also I think getting a better understanding and education of what is happening today in Kansas with our healthcare uh, providers and how they are protecting data. You know, I would point out that there are a lot of rules already in place through the feds and the state <clears throat> around um, protecting data. So uh, we wanna be careful to not create even more red tape that will make it more complicated and difficult to navigate. Thank you, Jennifer. And just a quick reminder, whenever we speak, um, this is Hina Shaw, Kansas Health Institute. I should do it too. Uh, make sure we say our name and our institution. So thank you. I've captured that. Yeah, this is Claudia Tucker with Teladoc, and I want to echo what Sunny had said. And while there are some certain standards being developed on the federal level along you know, congressional with FTC, uh, this is still a very open and new area that we we find ourselves in. And so I think that anything that we can do at the state level to develop best practices regarding confidentiality, privacy, et cetera, I think we will be miles ahead of the game. Thank you. Any last thoughts on revisions to this recommendation? <clears throat> so this is Jennifer. I, Shauna, can you, uh, you said something a few minutes ago about in-state providers versus out-of-state, and I didn't catch everything you were saying. Could you go back and revisit that? You bet. This is Shauna with the Center for Telemedicine. I, I said that, Jennifer, in the context of actually patient education about telehealth. Hopefully our providers understand that they need to be licensed where the patient or client is located at the time of the telehealth event. Hopefully that's that's understood at this point. Um, and if not, we do need to make sure we're assuring uh, our provider education. But a piece of that is helping our patients and clients understand that, that they play a role in that as well. And that if you've set up an appointment with a licensed provider in Kansas, and then you've gone to Arkansas or Texas or Florida, um, that they may not be able to see you and, and likely they won't be able. If you're, if you're on vacation and trying to connect, your provider isn't licensed in, in those states. So I, I, I was talking about that, Jennifer, under the umbrella of patient education with telehealth. Okay, thank you. This is Rennie Schuler McKinney at Vent Health, and I've been on the whole time, but I was on the live stream, unfortunately, so I couldn't speak. I'm now here, um, and I would just say, I, I don't know if there's any possibility to address that as a barrier. So your example of Arkansas, my team goes to Arkansas, and but can't see her therapist in Kansas City that she has a long-term relationship with. And so some of those barriers that are preventing people from accessing the mental health treatment that they need. Yeah, Brenda. Brenda. Hina, Brenda Landwehr, state representative. Um, I think along with all of this is when we talk about this in-state versus out-of-state, and I don't recall that we had several compacts that were done this last year in the healthcare industry. I don't believe that we had one in this area. So that may be something for us to look at to see. Representative, I think we just lost your sound. Okay, it's there. It's back. Do I need to start over? Do I need to start? Okay. Uh, you're about halfway, so you may want to. Okay, Brenda Landwehr, state oh. representative. We talked about uh, last year. We had several compacts that were done in the healthcare field, and so I think yes. that's something that we need to take a look at. Um, also. There was discussion on when we talk about rate parity, there's also discussion that needs to go along with that on uh, some codes because there were some folks that wanted to raise open codes that we may not want to necessarily do or not do for for varying reasons. So I hope I caught everybody back up where we need to be. Thank you. Anyone else before we move on to our next recommendation? This is Brittany Nichols with KDHE. I just wanted to ask a quick clarifying question on the last recommendation bolted there um, as far as allowing services to be provided flexibly when broadband access is limited. 
and this is probably just because I was not in the work group last year, but I was curious if that pertained to the location where the services were being provided or how the services were being provided. I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. This is Sandra with United Healthcare. I believe that had to do with telephonic, um, if I remember from the discussion last year. Hi, this is Sunny Mickle from Blue Cross of Kansas. And Sandra, I believe you're correct. And this is back to something I pointed out earlier, just um, clarifying things that I think that were um, not well understood about the current Kansas Telemedicine Act. Currently under the Kansas law, we are permitted to have audio only telehealth visits, but there was some um, misunderstanding about this. And I think it would be important for us to talk about that with those practitioners like Shauna that are using these services today uh, so that we can clarify exactly what is meant by that and if there's something that is missing. Thank you, Sunny, and others have brought that up. This is Hina Shaw, Kansas Health Institute. From the report last year, it says, given current broadband deficiencies in the state, telephonic behavioral health services should be allowed by payers when needed to address access issues and guidelines for audio only telehealth visits. And this is Shauna Wright and Sunny, I'd like to revisit the and really review the, the Telemedicine Act because I it was my understanding there that there's actually a line in the act that says telephone only is not included in the definition of telemedicine in Kansas. So there may be some confusion around that. Um, I know that, for instance, the Rural and Frontier Subcommittee very much endorses um, access to telephone only particularly with behavioral health services um, if broadband is not sufficient in, in some of our frontier communities. Um, but I, I, I guess I need to put my eyes on that language with the Telemedicine Act because um, many believe that, that in the definition, telephone only is excluded from the definition of telemedicine in Kansas. Thank you. I've added that as a research component. We can um, ask for that to be presented at our next meeting. So just in the interest of time, I am going to move us along to the next risk recommendation. And we're gonna do a quick screen share switcheroo amongst our KHI staff as well. Um, and so we are talking about now 10.2, which is reimbursement codes. And so the recommendation is to maintain reimbursement codes added during the public health emergency for telebehavioral health services and consider options to prevent loss of facility fees so that providers are not losing revenue by delivering telehealth services. Again, the lead here was KDG's Division of Healthcare Finance and key collaborators were KDADs, MCOs, and CMHCs. Um, and so we did have an update from KDG about them concurring with the telehealth codes, but it's um, subject to CMS. And so KDADs as well talks about um, supporting this as well. So knowing kind of where we are and what was done last year, I want to pose the same questions again for this one. So what are some factors that enabled this recommendation to make progress last year? Let's start with that. Well, this is Sunny Mickle from Blue Cross of Kansas. And I think most of us would agree that the pandemic um, reduce some of those barriers that are traditionally in place when it comes to reimbursement because um, we all, including the federal government, were supportive of issues um, and ways to create more access. Private payers also uh, were paying full parity um, because they could not anticipate whether or not provider offices would be open at the time. And a lot of the different decisions that were made are contingent on the public health emergency and what happens with that. And how long it is actually extended. Thank you. Would someone else like to share? This is Sandra with United. And I think another element that helped this um, move along was the fact that there were already several behavioral health codes on the Medicaid side that were approved for telehealth. And so it was a little easier for providers to move and expand services into that space already. So um, that did help. Thank you. Anyone else? 
<clears throat> this is Jennifer with KHA. I feel like the patients have become much more open, willing, and accepting of telemedicine. In fact, it's almost an expectation now that it will be offered as an option. So this experience that it has kind of enabled acceptance on the patient side. Thank you. And this is Sunny Mickle from Blue Cross of Kansas. Um, something that I would like to maybe learn more about, and maybe Sandra and others that are more familiar with Medicaid could help with this. Um, there was a mention about certain codes on the Medicaid side that had previously been approved, whereas in the private um, insurance world, it's not related specifically to codes. So I think it would be very helpful for um, those participating in this work group to understand the difference maybe in Medicaid and versus private insurance, because I know when we're talking about um, looking at specific codes, it, it's just not the way it's working right now in the commercial market. It's more so about all the services that are available rather than just limited to a set of codes. This is Shauna Wright from the Center for Telemedicine, and I, I'd invite those comments as well. My memory of that, Sunny, when it comes to the Medicaid codes, particularly for behavioral health for individuals who are severely persistently mentally ill or children who have severe emotional disorders would be codes that I don't think commercial insurers would cover. But I, I believe that when we're looking at behavioral health, the expansion of codes included like case management and those types of supports that we found could be um, effectively delivered uh, through telehealth, particularly, you know, our, our frontier areas can benefit from that by having that virtual case management. So I believe that was some of the codes when we look at behavioral health. Um, and I, I'd invite others to, to speak to the expansion of codes, but um, particularly for our most severe individuals, both children and adults, I think we were looking at codes that extended beyond our basic therapy and psychiatric services. Yes. This is Claudia yes. with Teladoc, and as we're speaking about barriers, one of the things that I wanted to bring to the forefront, um, for companies that are not based in Kansas but have a large group of clients there, uh, including Medicaid, what we are finding out is that the Medicaid regulations and requirements are have not contemplated telehealth. So, for example, in order to get a DME, DME Medicaid provider ID, you have to have a bricks and mortar presence there in the state. And not many people realize that, but it really is a barrier for companies, not just your know, Teladoc and our competitors, quite frankly. And so, as you know, the, again, the regulations just haven't caught up with what telehealth is able to provide to Kansans. Thank you. And this is Shauna again from the Center for Telemedicine. Claudia, that's true of most states. Is that correct? I mean, even even to and panel, I think with with Medicare, they they require bricks and mortar within um, the state. I believe um, in some of the con consulting I've done. So that that's something for us to look at and address. But but I don't believe we're the only state that that has that issue. Is that correct? Right, Shauna, you are not the only state. Uh, I would say right now it's about 50-50. And it's one of those things that we're having to point out to the states because many of them aren't even aware of it. So, no, it's about 50 50 now, but just pointing it out to Kansas. This is Sandra with United. And going back to Sunny and um, Shauna's questions around the codes, you're right, they did expand more into the community based services code. I'm thinking primarily of substance use codes where expanded more into telehealth peer support um you know some of the psychiatric support services that the community mental health centers provided were expanded um, some of the autism support services were expanded into telehealth so we did see a quite a bit of expansion beyond just the traditional therapy codes and the enm codes Yeah, so we've been talking a little bit about enablers and barriers um, and some revisions or research that is needed as well. Any, when looking at the um, recommendation itself, any other revisions besides that or other research about this recommendation? I think uh, Hina, Brenda Landwehr, state rep, 
I think the discussion along with our telehealth, because we know many times mental health involves substance abuse as well. So those two will have to go hand in hand in this discussion. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this recommendation? Hina, had you moved, this is Shauna with the Center for Telemedicine, had you moved to barriers with this recommendation? I'm sorry if I missed that. We started talking about them, but we can fully discuss barriers to this recommendation. One of the things that I would, because this comes down to, to parity, right? Uh, to that, that uh, and, and we also talked about facility fees, but I think one of the barriers and some of the pushback on payment parity really has to come down to really researching the cost of telehealth, because there are instances, I believe, where telehealth would be more affordable and easier to deliver, but there are instances where it may even be more expensive. And until we study that, and not only looking at the physician's time or the provider's time, but the whole workflow of telehealth, including the, the tax and, and requirement on our support staff, our IT staff, what are our costs associated with EHR maintenance and, and platform, tele-video platform maintenance? There are so many elements that would become a part of that actuary that we can't assume that, that the cost of telehealth to the provider or the organization as well as, as the consumer would be the same. And, and in some instances, it's going to be more. You know, some of our medical providers you know, to do a basic appointment, they have to, it takes them 15 lo minutes longer than it would in person. And how do we account for that time? Um, and right now, you know, it's, it's not easy to measure that during the pandemic because some of our providers are reporting that they're their own IT support staff and that takes time away from the appointment. You know, there are so many costs. I, I think that we need to research and be fair with telehealth, not to incentivize the use of telehealth and also not to de-incentivize the use of telehealth. But that, that's what I see as one of the barriers is that we haven't really studied those cost elements to, to figure out um, how to, to make it a viable option here in Kansas without trying to tip the scales one way or the other. You know, Brenda Land, we're state rep. So and I, that's a very good point, Shauna, is that the question I would have then is who and how do we go about such a study? Because that would prob that would be outside of what this committee would be able to do. So is it something that we would at some point perhaps put into our report to ask the legislature to have studied? But if you just say study, what does that mean? What are the details on that? What would we look for? Who would be the right people to, to do that? So just something as we go forward, but a great point. This is Brittany Nichols with KDHE, and I'm curious if a possible result of that study would maybe be some sort of comparison and analysis that could be provided to psych, like psychology providers um, to help them determine in which cases would telehealth be preferable to that patient, um, you know, looking at all aspects, not just, you know, the patient disposition, but also, you know, the financial impact as well as maybe some community factors um, might make it really easy for providers and patients both to kind of understand what care to choose and why it's being chosen. This is Jennifer from KJ. Perhaps if we're going to revisit or visit this study issue, we might also want to look at what some other states have done around the parity issue to understand how um, others are addressing this and what they have uh, determined is appropriate. Thank you. Any other barriers? So I heard a few revisions, at least around um, studying telehealth. Any other revisions when you just look at the recommendation? The other thing that was brought up was to think about the Medicaid versus commercial side as well, and to add that into the recommendation. All right, hearing none, I'm going to move us along then. So next we're going to look at 10.3, which is telehealth for crisis services. Um, at the special committee meeting, this was checked off as completed. And so we will talk about the enablers there, if there are already barriers again as well. Um, I may have us, if there's revisions or things we want to think about, um, 
you know, for 2022, maybe expanding on the recommendation, that could be considered as well. But if the recommendation is completed, we should also look at measuring the impact and how um, outcomes can be looked at as well. So let's start with enablers. What enabled, you know, what were some factors that enabled this recommendation to make progress last year? takers this is sandra with united i think a lot of this was already in place mm -hmm. um and, and then just expanding it as resources became available and out of necessity because of the pandemic and i think in the mobile crisis policy that has rolled out as of october 1st it was built into that as well as an option, so this not is not as primary, but as an option for when a person could not get out there in person. So this is leveraging a program that was in place and kind of building upon that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. And this is Shauna Wright from the Center for Telemedicine. I agree with Sandra. I think part of it is not knowing sometimes the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing not knowing what's available and, and what's coming down the pike and also not knowing who's responsible for those elements so i think you know just that that public awareness and organizational awareness and sandra i don't know if you can speak to this i think part of the concern in telehealth prior to the pandemic as we look because we know crisis services have been available but like when we look at the co-responder model if we're using telehealth and there may be an iPad co-responder with, with a law enforcement officer, I think there's been some hesitancy on will that be reimbursed because of the originating site. I, I think some of those things uh, still maybe need to be either defined or, or provided having an educational model so that our providers feel comfortable stepping into that space. Yeah, this is Sandra with United. I agree, Shauna. I think there probably needs to be more education and um, especially as we go to more technology-based um, intervention that shares across different agencies, that um, we clarify that for them. So I agree, we need to add that on there. And this is Shauna one more time. The other thing that I think is important for our state as we look at this is looking at how these um, these services um, roll out based on geography. Uh, I don't think that we can hold our rural and frontier communities to the same um, rollout as we do our metro areas. There, there are many more barriers, uh, everything from distance to available broadband. And I, I think um, ensuring that we're addressing the needs of our rural and frontier communities that, that may not have all of these resources to still make sure we're supporting the rollout and the availability of these crisis services is important as well. And this is Sandra too, and it's going to look different. I mean, as you were saying that, Sean, I was thinking it's going to look different based on what the resources are in that community. So you may have a rural community that um, will use some telehealth resources in a jail, but you may have a urban community that that's just not going to be feasible for so being flexible i think in how you describe that is going to be important so it sounds like we've highlighted some barriers to implementation or way, ways that we could measure impact that way um so in the measuring impact any other enablers or barriers that anyone else wants to bring up So then when we go to that other column of measuring impact in last year's report, there were two um, measures. One was the number of telehealth crisis codes open for Medicaid reimbursement. And the other one was utilization of these telehealth crisis codes. Um, 
I did add based on the conversation kind of roll out based on geography if different um, markers want to be put there. But what are some other measures um, that could be considered? This is Brittany Nichols, KDHE. I think it would be interesting to see maybe like an age range distribution of who the services are being provided to to see, you know, if there is a like, maybe they're more useful for children or maybe for the older population. I think that might help identify a little more about who needs those types of services. Any others? All right, then I will move us along to the next recommendation, which is recommendation 10.4 originating in distant sites. So, for this 1, the following items should be addressed to ensure that individuals receive and providers offer telehealth in the most appropriate locations. So, adopt a broad definition of originating site consistent with the Kansas telemedicine act. Allow staff to provide services from homes or other non clinical sites. If patient privacy and safety standards can be met. And examine issues related to providers practicing and patients receiving services across state lines, such as by exploring participation in interstate licensure compacts. And so the action lead here is the legislature with key collaborators, KDHE, KDATS, and providers. So the legislature enacted SB 283, which amends the provision allowing an out of state physician to practice telemedicine to treat Kansas patients to replace a requirement. And such physician notify the State Board of Healing Arts and meet certain conditions with a requirement the physician hold a temporary emergency license granted by the board. So that was one step that was made towards implementing this recommendation. Um, so let's first talk about, you know, enablers for making progress. Aside from SB 283. This is Shauna, right? I was wondering, um, and I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not up to date, but did the legislation for SIPAC, was that passed? Because I would think that that would fall here as well, the, the interstate licensure compact for psychologists. I'll have to look up the bill number, but I was under the impression that it may have passed or is close to being passed. I think that that would fall under progress toward that as well. This is Hina Shuk HI. Kayla or Dee, would you be able to provide an update on that? Or I can circle back with you later. Yes, I will double check on that and then I will circle back with you. You know, this is Brenda Landwehr, state representative. I believe that we did towards the end of the session uh, pass that compact. Thank you. Any this other? Is... Go ahead. Sorry, this is Leanne Thone with KLRD. Um, I do have that the bill number for that is SB 170. Thank you, Hina Shek HI. Any um, other factors that enabled this recommendation to make progress last year? All right, then um, what are some barriers that didn't allow this recommendation to become fully actionable? This is Jennifer. Sean. Sorry, go ahead, Sean. Well, no, go ahead, Jennifer. I'll, I'll follow you. Okay. All right. Well, this is Jennifer from KHA. I think we have talked earlier about confusion over what the Kansas Telemedicine Act truly does allow now and what it doesn't. Um, I think that was a barrier sometimes in this particular situation, and we need to look closely at what those definitions really do say. Uh, let's not leave ambiguity. Let's be very clear about what we will allow and not allow. I'm glad that I, I, I'm I following you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, I know that the Kansas Telemedicine Act very broadly says the originating site is the site where the, the client or patient is located at the time of the event. I have concerns. Um, I'm doing some training uh, right now, the, the demand for professional education with telehealth is is way up. Um, while I believe that we should be able to meet the needs of our clients and patients and meet them in their home or in their office, uh, when I do training, um, 
we talk about the originating site should not be the backseat of an Uber. It should not be in a moving vehicle. Um, it, we want to meet the, the client or patient where they are. We want to provide them with education on how they can most effectively um, interact in a telehealth appointment. But it's it's not medicine to go. If, if we're going to hold our providers to their to their best practices and to their standard of care, there have to be some guidance around, you know, what what is allowable or what's absolutely not allowable. Um, so we we really advocated for delivery of services to the home, if the technology allows for an effective appointment. Um, but I I really get concerned when I hear you know you can meet your doctor in your car, Th that's not best practice, um, and I don't want to push out you know anything other than what's best practice. So I think. Um, you know, helping educate our providers about how to set those limits and set those frames is important. Um, but right now the definition is broad, um, but but there are some instances where we should say, and, and providers have shared all kinds of stories with us. You know, my patient connected with me and they were on there. They were a roofer and they were on a roof on a break. Not the best place to do a, a history and physical with with a patient. Um, so I, I think we can't be willing nilly as well. I, I want to have some expansion here, but I think we have to be very thoughtful about helping guide our providers around that originating site. Brenda Land, where and you know, as we look at that, something else to keep in mind is in discussions I had with the folks in Oklahoma when we were talking about mobile crisis units and what we're planning on tying to the new 988 uh, suicide, suicide prevention line. They are, I do not know why I'm getting an echo. They are actually putting tablets in the field with law enforcement, et cetera. So that would kind of cross to what you're saying because that's an immediate crisis situation versus a session so there may be need to be clear. I do not know how Oklahoma is doing that. It was kind of one of the concerns that I had. So I think as we proceed forward with this, if uh, uh, legislative research can uh, find out what they've done, how they did it, what did they write in their laws for that? Because a crisis is different than a session. So good point, John. Yeah, this is Shauna Wright with the Center for Telemedicine. I agree, Representative Landwehr. Uh, and, and the other part of that is those mobile crisis units have have individuals who are trained to deploy this equipment, right? Um, there, it's not necessarily someone driving down the road on their way to pick up their child from daycare, trying to have a therapy session, you know, on the fly or for their 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 greatest convenience. Um, it's a very different uh, purpose with trained personnel that are there to support it needed. Um, so having definitions, I, I agree. We don't want to rule out. I have worked with with clients who have been in a parked car outside of their home because their cell phone worked better outside of their home than they could have inside. But I still had a physical location of where they were, and I didn't have to worry about them being involved in a car accident because they were distracted with engaging in a therapeutic session. So I, I think there are some parameters uh, that we need to look at. I, I think we need to be able to physically locate a client or a patient that we're interacting with through telehealth. Um, but I, I really appreciate that point and looking at being flexible based on the, the purpose and intent of the services that are being delivered. Brenda, this is Brenda Land, we're state rep. And along with that, Shauna, it's not on those uh, mobile crisis units. They are not always in a situation to where they may have that uh, mental health professional with them, or maybe law enforcement has, has been called out to a situation. So they're actually law enforcement alone without a professional with them have these tablets. So I just think it's something for us to look at and see what kind of laws they put in place. Claudia you Tucker know. with Teladoc. And I just want to, we have to meet our patients where our patients are at that time. And the standard of care should be the overriding uh, guideline for everything. Unfortunately, we've got people that have called us and their car is their home. That's the only place they have to live. I don't want to disenfranchise those people. By the same token, we've got people with severe PTSD that the only place they call our psychiatrists are from the closets. Eventually, the goal is to get them out of the closet and maybe eventually get them into the office. 
But I think that standard of care should be the overriding principle here. If the standard of care can be met, then the consult should go forward. If a psychiatrist realizes that somebody's driving down the road and it's heavy traffic and that's not safe, maybe he or she says, hey, let's let's talk again in 30 minutes. You know, when you're you know better in a better position to to concentrate here. But I just don't want us to legislate heavily and then create barriers when we don't have to. You know, it's Eileen from the revisor's office. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to bring up the point. If you try to nail down a definition uh, to even to the extent of where the patient is speaking to, to Ms. Shah's comments, uh, how are you going to enforce that? It becomes really, really difficult to do that. So that's a thought that I wanted to put out there. Um, you can recommend all you want. You can put guidelines out there all you want, but the minute you put it into law, you kind of have to have an enforcement mechanism. And to that to that point of view, you know, what if the person, you know, tele, telemedicine is marketed as being convenient for all and, you know, contact your doctor from work. With regard to the roofer who's on top of the roof on his break, that's, that is where he works. So are you going to say that we're going to treat people without offices differently from those who do have offices because now you're talking about a potential discrimination effect. So these are all things that I kind of want to put out there as issues when you really try to narrow things down quite so much. And I just wanted to share those thoughts with you. This is Shauna from the Center for Telemedicine, and I really I appreciate that conversation, and those are all valid points. I think it comes back to what Claudia said, and, and knowing that the majority of professionals who are delivering telehealth right now have not had telehealth training. And, you know, where, where we start with professionals is helping them to understand that their in-person standard of care should match their telehealth standard of care. And if we can deliver that, then, then that's how we proceed. And if we can't, or if it increases our liability or poses a risk to the patient to proceed, um, you know, that man may need to come down off of the roof to assist us in doing a physical uh, and in history with him. It may not be safe for him to engage in that while on a rooftop. The, the, the client who connects and is in the produce aisle, um, you know, at the local grocery store may not be in the best place for us to, to ensure their privacy and confidentiality. So I agree, and maybe the language is that we must maintain the same, you know, or equivalent standard of care um, based on the, the, the place where the, the client originates their appointment. Uh, but we, in the end, it's our license and our liability that's on the line. And if we can't deliver care through telehealth to the same standard that we are in person, then, then we're really taking on a lot of risk. This is Sandra with United and Shauna, I'm gonna segue from what you just said about um, licensing and accountability. When we look at folks out of state that aren't licensed within our state, what do what assurances do we have to maintain that they're going to have our folks within our state's best interest in, in mind? When we opened up the telehealth um, because of the pandemic, we here at United got an onslaught of applications to join our network from folks from out of state. They wanted to open up telehealth services here. Um, we had no way to monitor or regulate, you know, within the state, whether they were good providers or not. Um, and so I think we have to be cautious that we don't just open the floodgates and that we have some kind of oversight and accountability for if they're going to cross over state lines. Um, yes, there are people out there, unless we have an interstate compact or some way to make sure we have that accountability. Okay, Brenda Landwehr, state representative. It appears that Senate Bill 170 was signed into law in May, and that is our site pack. So I think you know, that's going to give us a whole lot of guidance on what we're talking here as we move forward to keep some consistency, because what we've learned in, in all the different areas where we've already got some packs out there is that it has really been a benefit for uh, Kansas. So I'd say that we look at uh, what we did in 170 and that's our guidance. 
Um, this, this is Jennifer. Don oh. I'm sorry. I was just going to add, um, this is Leanne Thone from KLRD. Um, SB 170 goes into effect on January 1st, 2022. Uh, this is Jennifer and with KHA, I was just going to say, not only do I think we ought to look at clarifying um, the originating site, but for our hospitals, distant site was a concern and wanted to make sure that as they maybe sent some providers home to work remotely, that they still were clearly within the confines of being able to provide those services to patients that needed them. So I just want to make sure we have good clarity on both sides. This is Claudia Tucker with Teledoc Health. I want to follow up on what the representative said. Um, I have insights and, and I've got folks in all 50 states and so have a unique perspective in what's going on nationwide, even though I know that right now we're concerned, we're, we're concerned about Kansas. But many states now are starting to adopt legislation that says if you are a provider licensed and in good standing in one state, you can practice in our state. You just have to register. So it takes away the administrative burden, it takes away the financial barrier, and it then gives uh, access to Kansans to a greater number of physicians when they're needed. Um, and that seems to be working quite well. And this is Shauna Wright from the Center for Telemedicine. And I, I think that, that that's, that's a good point, particularly if there are specialties or areas where we are very underserved in our state. Um, at the same time, I think it's worth talking with our regulatory boards about that as well in terms of what happens because our regulatory boards do, you know, they, they provide our licenses, they provide our, regula our regulations, but their number one job is consumer protection. And so if, if we allow people to register, uh, let, let's say we have an Arkansas provider that registers in, in the state of Kansas and something goes wrong, something catastrophic goes wrong, what is the recourse for that patient? Because our licensing boards would have no recourse. Um, and does that state, would Arkansas pursue an action against a provider when their own resident wasn't harmed? Uh, and, and there are just a lot of things to think about there in terms of recourse and protecting consumers in the state as well. Um, I, I think we have to find a balance between access, but also consumer protection and, and we're going to get there. We're going to, we're going to get there. I just don't know that we're there right now. Thank you. And with that comment, and in the interest of time, I'm going to move us along to the last recommendation for the day. And so the last one is 10.5, which is child welfare system and telehealth. This is to utilize telehealth to maintain service and provider continuity as children, particularly foster children, move around the state. Consider how the unique needs of parents of children in the child welfare system can be met via telehealth. The action lead is KDAG with support and collaboration with KDADS and DCF. So some progress has been made on this recommendation by KDAG, they value telehealth provides um, with the foster care youth. And so what are some factors that enable this recommendation to make progress last year? So while we have recognition from the state, the state did say that the Medicaid program must follow CMS rules governing the allowability of telehealth in order to qualify for the match funds. So while we've, they've highlighted a barrier, what were some enablers? This is Sam Peter with um, United Healthcare. And I think one of the enablers is children in the welfare system qualify for Medicare or Medicaid and get the services that are offered through telehealth. So that is one um, and um, can get those services. And I'm going to stop there because I started to say, but, <laughs> but I'll stop there. Thank you. Any other thoughts? And I did want to announce one thing that I missed. Sunny Mickle had to step away around 158. She has not returned yet. So I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. 
Any other thoughts around enablers for this recommendation? This is Brittany Nichols with KDHE, and I do think it's been very helpful that there has been a lot of work done relating to behavioral health screenings conducted virtually as well as how to conduct a virtual home visit. And so I feel there's been a lot of work done as far as how can we ensure high quality care is being provided to these vulnerable youth, considering the fact that they are at greater risk of maltreatment and neglect. And so I feel like the, the current landscape as far as what education and training opportunities are available has been an enabler. Of course, a barrier being that we don't have any way to always enforce that providers are undertaking those trainings. It has to be a lot more self-directed. So I apologize. I feel like that was both an enabler and a barrier. It's okay. It's good to one bird, two pieces of bread, right? Or the other way around. Any other thoughts? Um, we can move into barriers. What are some barriers that didn't make this recommendation fully actionable? And thank you, Brittany, for kicking that off. This is Shauna for the Center for Telemedicine. I, I'd like to mention, I don't have the report in front of me, but the uh, when the uh, subcommittees for the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council spoke, the children's subcommittee shared that balance of their appreciation for the availability of, of telehealth, uh, particularly in underserved areas, but really for all patients during the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Rachel Brown did speak, though, of barriers that, that come up in treating children, that there are some conditions, some assessments, some screenings that are very, very difficult to translate through telehealth. And so, you know, I think part of that is making sure that that training, you know, pediatric telehealth, that there's training available, that we can direct providers to good training. Uh, when I work with behavioral health professionals that are in training now, their number one question with children is how do I engage them? How do I meet my goals? Uh, because it can be more difficult to engage a child through telehealth. Some love it, you know, they love the technological interaction, but for some, especially those who have the more severe disorders, it can be very difficult to reach through that camera and, and connect with the child. Um, so I think we have to be cognizant that this is a special population. And then if we're looking at children within the DCS, you know, the, the DCF umbrella, um, we just need to be cognizant that those providers may want and may seek help and, and it might be helpful to help them find the training and, and get develop some of those skills in delivering through uh, the nuances of delivering uh, behavioral health care through telehealth. Um, as well as helping them recognize that there might be some times where telehealth just isn't the best option. This is Sandra with yeah, United. And I think any one of the barriers I've seen is that children in DCF custody often are moved from placement to placement and move providers. And so that that disruption, they can't really fully get through their their therapy or get through the treatment that is needed because then they they may disrupt or they may go to another foster area. And so the consistency isn't always there, but telehealth offers that so that they, they can maintain the relationship and the consistency with a provider. Um, and so I, I see that as an opportunity, but it's also a barrier when our providers um, sometimes have the mindset of they are located in my catchment area. So they, you know, they're mine for now, but once they move and they belong to someone else. Brittany Nichols, KDHE, I just wanted to tag on to what Sandra was saying about that consistent care. And unfortunately for the children in the foster care system, reliable access to the resources needed to connect with telehealth is also a big barrier because these children don't always have reliable access to audiovisual equipment. And so how do we ensure that those children are able to engage in and receive those services if we're not out there? You know, we, we can't realistically distribute a tablet to every single child in the foster care system that would need one. but. I'm just making sure that they have a way to routinely access those visits and you know receive those services. Anyone else want to share a barrier? All right, then when looking at the recommendation itself, 
Are there any revisions to the recommendation? This is Sandra with United. I was looking at the last part of that. Consider how the unique needs of parents of children in the child welfare system can be met via telehealth. Not really sure what we were trying to get at there. Oftentimes parents um, aren't covered either by Medicaid or other insurance. So how would we support that? I mean, I, I, I like the idea. I think it's critical, but I'm not sure how we would support that. This is Shauna with the Center for Telemedicine. I couldn't agree with you more, Sandra. My background is in community mental health and in a rural area. Um, and you're so right that oftentimes parents don't have access to any kind of coverage that would promote that. I wonder if um, we can't solve that through this, right? But I wonder if if there was any intention here to, you know, engage parents as deemed acceptable by DCF in the child's treatment if, you know, uh, telehealth was used. Can we, you know, engage parents if we're looking towards reintegration? Um, but, but you're right. That's it's a significant barrier for these families. But I don't know that we can solve that issue here. I, I don't. I don't remember what we intended there. So in the this is Hina Shaw KHI in the report. It says additionally, parents of children in the child welfare system may have behavioral health treatment needs, substance use, mental health, or both that need to be resolved in order to support reunification of the child back into the home. So you did get at that. Consistent access and availability of telebehavioral health services for parents could significantly increase case plan compliance and support timely reunification for children. Any other thoughts around the revision? Any final thoughts on the five recommendations that we've reviewed so far? We have about two minutes before I'll move us to our next agenda item. So thus far, I have um, jotted down a few things about a telemedicine act summary. Um, I also wanted to point out that the children's subcommittee report has about 2 pages around telehealth. Um, I think it was page 9 and 10 and that um, is available under the special committee materials for September 28th, but we can also send it out after this meeting. Any last thoughts about the 5 recommendations we've talked about today? All right, then I'm going to ask Samaya to actually um, close this file and she is going to share a worksheet that we will send out to you later this week. Um, and what it is is a recommendation development worksheet. One of the new topics um, that the special committee has asked this work group to discuss is payment parity. And so once she has that on the screen, I will kind of step you through it and then. Um, that worksheet would be sent only to me um, because we do not want to violate any meeting rules and I would be able to compile what is suggested from everyone for our next meeting that is on um, October 20th. Meanwhile, as you have been thinking about these recommendations, are there other experts that we need to bring to this meeting to discuss issues. Do you have anyone in mind? One that has been suggested so far is Dorothy Hughes from the University of Kansas. Is there anyone else or any other supplemental expert? Hina? Uh-huh. Uh, this is Carrie Ruffett. 
So I was just going to note that Dorothy has been working on just for FYI for the group. You all may, may be familiar. Um, Dorothy at KU has been working um, on a number of pieces of research around telemedicine and telehealth, uh, particularly during COVID-19. So I think that's the perspective and including from the provider as well as patient experience. Shauna could probably tell us all about it, but <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, and I believe that Dorothy has, or some of that uh, work has been presented to legislative committees previously. Thank you for expanding. All right, well, as you are thinking that through, um, we have on the screen here a worksheet for developing a new recommendation. So the topic, of course, is telehealth payment parity, which was assigned. And so in the language of the telemedicine acts, insurers are authorized to establish reimbursement for services in the same manner as reimbursement for covered in-person services. But payment parity, which is telehealth services be reimbursed at the same rate as in person services is not required. So that's why the special committee has asked this work group to discuss telehealth payment parity, along with what representative Landware said earlier with um, the bill and the actions taken last year. And so to help guide the development of a new recommendation, uh, along with giving some supporting materials, the worksheet asks for a few steps. So first, to suggest a smart, so a specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based recommendation around payment parity. And I've provided an example using one of the recommendations from last year. Next, we would like you to identify any research you used in crafting this recommendation. The next thing is to identify any additional research or information needed to clarify or discuss this recommendation indicate any people or groups, so supplemental experts who could discuss this recommendation, and then what kind of action or resources would be necessary to implement the recommendation. And for those of you that were part of the subgroup last year are familiar with this rubric because we will later rate um, and think through how to make this recommendation as actionable as possible. So that's a worksheet that will be sent later this week to all of you to complete because our next meeting is next Wednesday on October 20th, um, and it'll be at 1 p.m. again. Any questions on this worksheet? You know, Brenda uh, Landwehr, State Representative, I don't have a question on the worksheet. Um, I was going to see if it was possible, perhaps for the 20th meeting to be moved to start at 12 instead of one. I have an obligation at noon on the 20th. I'm actually doing a telehealth presentation that I wouldn't be able to move. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any other last thoughts or questions around the worksheet? Well, I thank you for your time in this conversation. Look out for an email from myself and KLRD. Um, we will send a summary of really high level um, summary of things that will be added to your meeting materials. And next week we will focus on refining some of the recommendations where revisions were discussed and then also diving into payment parity. So thinking through kind of what payment parity is and what it could mean to Kansas and also start looking at the recommendation language that you will propose. When that worksheet is sent out, the results can only be sent back to me. It cannot be shared with anyone else. So please be careful of that. All right, well, with that, thank you so much. Gina, I've got one question for you. Are these re are these recorded to where we can go back and look at them later? Because the twentieth, I'm in a, a committee hearing. So, okay. Yes, we are live streaming, and it's available on the YouTube page. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much today, everyone. I appreciate what you're doing, and the heavy lifting now begins. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.